So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And our opening today, it's opening prayer, it's Psalm 19. The heavens de- declare the glory of God, the firmament proclaims the works of His hands. Day unto day pours forth speech, night unto night whispers knowledge. There is no speech, no words, their voice is not heard. A report goes forth through all the earth, their message to the ends of the world. He has pitched in them a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom from his canopy, and like a hero joyfully run its course. From one end of the heavens it comes forth. Its course runs to the, to the other. Nothing escapes its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decrees of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The statues of the Lord are true, all of them just. More desirable than gold, than a hoard of purest gold. Sweeter also than honey, or drippings from the comb. By them your servant is warned, obeying them brings much reward. Who can detect trespasses? Cleanse me from my inadvertent sins. Also from arrogant ones restrain your servant. Let them never control me. Then shall I be blameless, innocent of grave sin. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable, the thoughts of my heart before you, Lord my rock and my redeemer. Almighty God, as we study today the book of Joshua and the importance of God's law and God's covenant in their history, in their lives, we ask that we will be faithful to our keeping of commandments in our lives. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I was listening to last week's recording and I realized that I went a little bit too fast and too far (laughs) because I skipped a couple of things. So we're going to go back a little bit so that you don't miss anything and I want to highlight a couple of things because it's important to look at some things. So let's go back more or less to chapter 14. Just to remind you, chapter 13, we begin Joshua who is now advancing years. He's old and God is telling him to start uh, let's say appointing land to the people, to the tribes. So, and God orders to, to, that to Joshua so that, just to remind, just to remind you why it's, this book is done this way. And this book is written in the times when people, when the kingdom is either divided in north and south, so they split in two, or they under uh, Babylonian or Assyrian occupation, they're in exile. So they struggle. They don't know, you know, this is, again, this book was written to help people remind about their history, about the, how the nations was built. So this is a description of how, how they have to look at the land that is right now either being divided or torn apart by war. So they, they have to be, in a way, strong and committed to go back or to rebuild the land in the parts that was given to each uh, tribe, each, each, each family. That's why this description is so detailed to give them some idea. Okay, this this was this belonged to my family, th- that belonged to my tribe, and that's what belongs to us. And when you look later on, all the way till time of Jesus and afterwards, they did that later on. So they were still be, be, they were still being able after the exile from Babylon, you know, come back after after 70 years or or 300 years, and they were able still to reestablish these tribal boundaries. Why? Because the book of Joshua gave them exact description how they're supposed to do that, and exactly exact location. So there was no surprises there. They knew where they were living. They knew which tribe was where, and they just followed the instruction of the book of Joshua. Okay. The only tribe again that did not receive anything is the tribe of Levi. Levites, why? Because they were supposed to be supported by all the other tribes in the temple, but also in the city. So we'll go to those in a moment. So chapter 14, yeah, we have to remember chapter 14, 15, 16, it's repetition always that Israel identity is rooted in their land. Why? Because land was an inheritance given to them by God. So their identity, as long as they kept the commandments, as long as they kept the covenant, they would have land and that would be their identity. So we keep the commandments, we keep the covenant, God rewards us with land. We don't keep commandments, we lose the land. That's book of Judges, we'll see that over and over again, it's going to happen. But the whole idea here is, 
your identity is in the covenant because that gives you the uh, right to settle in the land and that's how you have the right so uh, again and, and, then, and this whole inheritance also depends on keeping the covenant and uh, see that's, that's what is what even today that what people in Israel with what the you know, state of Israel what they will especially the orthodox Jew, Jews what they will promote they will say this land is ours because we keep covenant but then because state of Israel is very uh, let's say is not really religious at all you know, they're very secular so they, the, the Jews said all those problems with Palestinians and everything else is because the state is not a religious state so that's why that's you probably because you don't keep covenant God is not God is not blessing you because every covenant it comes with blessings and curses if you don't keep the covenant then the curses are falling upon you that's later on chapter 23 22-23 if you keep the covenant then all the blessings will be yours okay? so, that's, so that's the whole idea and even today they think like that because everything is about keeping the covenant in state of Israel for the orthodox Jews so, but also it's important because by keeping the covenant the Jewish people not only own the land but they were supposed to spread the faith, the message of God, into the entire world. That's why that's going back to the book of Exodus, be fertile, multiply, and take the message to all the world and all that. So this whole idea about, uh, let's say, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was the uh, chief rabbi of the Commonwealth. He died a couple of years ago. But he always said, you know, God always promised that if Jews will keep the covenant, he will give them the land. Unfortunately, neither Jews nor God did a pretty good the job with keeping their words. Because Jews never kept the covenant to the, to the letter and God, you know, never allowed them to keep that land because of that. So they kind of back and forth, back and forth with, between God and, and the Jews. So this whole idea is, uh, it's not only keeping the land, but also they were supposed to spread God's message to the, to the entire world. And they never did that. Why? Because they were too preoccupied with fighting with each other or with, with uh, let's say, following other gods. Only later on, as we know that in, in Jesus Christ, you know, the, this whole idea about the faith of in God of Israel was spread to the, to the entire world only because God intervened and God kept his, kept his word finally. But God said, okay, I'm going to show you how to do that so that you don't fight with each other, so that you don't go follow other gods. That's how you follow me, when you follow my son. So that's, that's why book, this book of Joshua, again, is a foreshadowing of uh, later on of the gospel of life of Jesus that's why as I told you the name is the same and the book also speaks talks about in the same ways when you look at the structure of the book it's kind of funny first is the description of the great Joshua who is like Moses when you read gospel of Matthew that's exactly what it is Jesus is the new Moses then we have uh, Joshua who is with Israel who is conquering the promised land that's the ministry of Jesus. The fathers of the church will say that this is, that's the ministry of Jesus. Was Jesus was calling in, chasing out the demons, healing people, proclaiming the good news. That was the conquering part. The part of settling in the land was sending, uh, let's say, sending the apostles to, uh, to evangelize the Jewish people. Because that was, you know, they went, each one of them, uh, to their own tribes. They were trying to spread the faith to Jewish people. That didn't work. So later on, what was happening? They did carry the work of that God called them to, meaning spreading the faith into the entire world by leaving Israel behind because it was a little bit too, let's say, they are too obstinate, put it that way, too hard-headed, as they call, right? So that's why Jesus later on becomes this fulfillment of the covenant because of the church, and church becomes the fulfillment of Jesus' mission, and uh, Jesus' mission of bringing God's word into the entire world, not just to the people of Israel. So, and then we'll see that later on, because in the days of the judges, kings and exile, Israel struggles to keep their uh, unity and identity. They always struggle with that. You know, unity, north and south of the kingdom, identity, they are in exile or they are divided. And they hate each other because north hates south and south doesn't want I, those northerners to come in because, you know, they messed up. They always do some other things with other guys. So the inheritance was, but the, the message in, in, this book, in this book is the inheritance can never be forgotten. Because it was given to them as a promise to their forefathers and to them. So this was something that, was, that belongs to them. 
unfortunately, every time they mess up, uh, let's say, well, God is reminding them that they need to go back to the covenant because the land was given by God and God can take it away. So this whole idea that, you know, keep these people to, through the difficult times to keep their unity. That's why from this moment on, I told you last time, you will hear all the Israel, all of the, na- all of the nation, all the people, all the people, over and over again. Why? Because they have to be reminded that they need to be united. And, you know, we see that in our country, right? That's, you know, this unity division causes a lot of problems. But this whole idea about all nations have to, you know, we, can, we might have differences, but we need to work together. That's what they're basically saying. And that also gives them, uh, let's say, when they are in exile, when they go through the difficult times, when they don't have the land, they still know that the land is theirs. And they come back if they remain faithful to the covenant. So it's always this connection between land, covenant, inheritance, promise, fulfillment. That's the whole cycle, as it is. You know, in our own lives, it's more, more or less the same way. What God is promising us, you know, at the time of baptism, you know, and the sacraments, that we receive eternal life, right? That we are part of the community. What we do, we walk away all the time, back and forth, back and forth. We need to be reminded by <coughs> sacraments that see, this is what we need to do. You know, Eucharist, that's what we need to do. That's what, we, that's what makes us, gives us eternal life when we are part of the body, when we are one with the body of Christ. See, when we are not one, when we are on our own, guess what? The part of, with, of the, with eternal life might be a little problematic. You know, with, you know, we, we don't know where we're going to end up. If we are in the church and try to do things together and work together, at least we know, we, you know, we might go to struggle here, but at least we won. And we, you know, we're going to get there eventually. Okay, so it's the same idea, the same idea. Church, as you see, church picks up a lot of, well, out of all of the ideas of theology in the church are from Old Testament. Sometimes we just, we just don't realize because, uh, it's not spelled out where it comes from. But this whole idea about one body, you know, being one, always doing things, you know, together. As Paul said, you know, each part of the body is different. You know, the head is not hand, hand is not eye, and all the other things, but they all work for the good of the body. All together. So this is how where it comes from. It's Joshua. So he goes in and ch- that chapter 14, he reminds them about this. And then it's the man who is called Caleb. Caleb was the other spy that went with Joshua uh, 40 years earlier. Actually, probably more than that at, the, at this moment. Who was the, one of the original spies. And he was, the two of them were the ones that brought a positive report. That they said, no, we can go and we can conquer the land. Uh, everybody else says no. So Caleb is being rewarded by uh, receiving a land that was owned by what they call them uh, Amalekites, Analekites, Kinzaid, Hebron, what is that? Anakim, Anakim, Anakim. If you remember the book of Joshua, those Anakim people were the giants. That's what people were afraid. So Caleb is coming to Joshua and says, give me the land of the giants. Because I'm going to make it mine. Why? Because he's not afraid of them. See, he's the, one of the original spies who was not, never afraid. And he's go, going back and said, now I'm going to kill all those giants and those Anakim and I will be the one who will take over the land. That's in verse uh, 15 of chapter 14. Is that in the theme that's referenced in Genesis? Is that who those giants are? Yeah, that's basically, that's what they said. It could be the same. We're not sure because it's a different name, but that, that was, there was only one when they brought the report to Moses, they said that they, those Anakim, those people were, were the, you know, very big in posture, giants like. So we are afraid of them. So this is, Book of Joshua is making sure that Caleb, who originally was the one who was not afraid of those Anakim, now he's going to go back and he's going to make, you know, short end of them. Because he's not afraid of them. Everybody else might be, he's not. Even after all those years. So chapter 15 and what's happened in chapter 15? We have God, who is the Lord, who is the King, and God is allotting land to His subjects. That's basically what it is. Because He says, this, is, this will be boundary. And chapter 15 basically sets up the beginning, sets up the boundaries of Israel. So the northern part is Horeb, and the southernmost part is uh, Bathsheba which is in the desert, right on the, not far from the uh, Egyptian border. So he gives us, you know, this, to the south is the Dead Sea and then the entire Jordan and 
Mediterranean Sea is to the to the east. So that's basically to the west. Sorry. So that's basically the, the boundaries that God is establishing. What is uh, kind of striking here? The Israelites never reach those boundaries. The, 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 the state of Israel, no, not state of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, either at the time of judges, at the time of kings, and even later on, it never reached those boundaries that God has established. An explanation of rabbis will say, we never reached those boundaries because we were never faithful and we were never willing to go and conquer this, those lands. Because God is telling them, I'm giving you the land, go take it. And they were never willing to do it all the way through. That's why they don't own it today, or they, they never owned it, the, to the extent that God wanted them to. Okay. So we're not going to go to those boundaries, you can read that to yourself. You can read that with, with a map, actually. It's a pretty interesting exercise when you look at the names of, you know, the, of the names and map of old ancient Israel. You, you can see all the, uh, all the maps, all the places and so on. And then we go to chapter 16. Because those, you know, again, describing all those cities, if you notice it, it's 126 cities that they conquer. So when you see that was 126 city states when the Israelites entered the Promised Land. That's why they were able to conquer them all, because if it was one state, one, they will probably never be able to conquer them. But it was 126 different city states, that's why they were able to take them over, gradually over. Because, again, they were divided. Israel is all one. They fight like one people. The other ones, they have to make alliances that don't last. They never get along and so on and so forth. So, so those 126 cities, and uh, what's special about them? Okay, so now we have the division of the land, and it goes by seniority, I would put it that way. I told you that last time. It starts with, pla- uh, with tribe of Judah. Why? Because Judah is the, uh, uh, let's say he's the one who was this most important of the sons of Joseph, of Israel, then goes to Ephraim and Manasseh, who are the sons of Joseph, because there is no such a thing like tribe of Joseph. Uh, Joseph has two sons, sons, and when Israel when uh, was dying, when Jacob was dying, he blessed those two sons. He said, Joseph, will, you will not have inheritance. Your sons will be two tribes that will take over, and they will be the most important of the tribes. When you look at the map that is in the, in the booklet, you will see that Manasseh owns the most of the territory. Ephraim, though, was the most prosperous, the most, the most affluent, they, because they own the most fertile part of Israel. You know, what's today uh, Samaria and Galilee, part of it. Very fertile, very, so they were, they were very powerful because of that. And then after that, we have all the, the rest of the minor tribes. Minor, why? Because they were smaller, but also they were, let's say, they weren't children of uh, beloved Rachel, Rachel, because even Benjamin received only a very small piece of land between um, Ephraim and uh, Judah, and uh, tribe of, uh, what's his name? Simeon totally, Simeon totally disappears later on. And then at the very end, we will see that the, the Joshua assigns cities to the Le- Levites. Each tribe will give Levites four cities. So in total there will be 48 cities that be, will be owned by the Levites. So in each tribe, Levites will own four cities. And six of them will be the cities of refuge. We talk about cities of refuge, we're going to rem- go back to that in a, in a moment. Because Levites were the ones who were to run the cities of refuge. Okay? What was the city of refuge? Again, if you committed a crime, if you killed someone without premeditation, if you killed someone by accident, in order to avoid the goal, someone who was, you know, from your family to, who was to kill you, remember, there is no police force, there is no law enforcement, everybody does his own thing, you know, king, he enforces his own law. If you kill someone, it's the, uh, let's say, it's family is, uh, which is responsible to punish you, the family of that killed person. If you kill someone by accident, you have right to run away. So that you go to the refuge city and you ask for asylum in the refuge city. And that refuge city, unlike our refuge city in this country right now, you will, <coughs> what was, what was, what was interesting then, you will have to stay in this, in this refuge city for the rest of your life. Unless there was a year when high priest died 
that moment he will be released from the obligation to stay there. So how often the high priest dies? I don't know, every 10, maybe 15 years, whatever it is. But only then they, they will be released, they could go back to their own uh, family and so on. Because, you see, this is a punishment almost like a prison. Because you go to this refuge city and that's it, you cannot leave. You have to make your life there. And you have no connections, you don't know anybody, your family is not there, uh, what are you going to do? This is not very specialized you know, uh, society. They're mostly agrarian, they're mostly shepherds, you know, that's what they do mostly. Everything else is, you know, if you're a farmer, you're not going to hire a, uh, someone to, to fix your, uh, let's say, cart or whatever, because you can do most of the thing yourself. And you know how to fix your car, right? You don't going to hire someone to, to fix your car. You buy the part and you do it yourself. They were like that because it's a very primitive agrarian society. So if you lived in the city of refuge, guess what? It was pretty miserable existence. Unless your family will support you, but then again, you, know, you expose yourself to, a dan- to danger. So, so we have that. And then there is a problem with those tribes, as they, I told you last time, because the smaller tribes are complaining that the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim received too much land. And I told you about the, the law of inheritance in, in Israel. The oldest son receives two-thirds of inheritance. The rest of the children receive just one-third. That remaining one-third is divided in ten, fifteen, or whatever people are there to inherit this. So, because Manasseh and Ephraim, they replaced Reuben, who was the firstborn, because that's what Jacob did. He blessed them and said, you are the firstborn, you replaced that, that Reuben who, uh, let's say, slept with his concubine. So, they are the ones who received the double of everything else, of others. So, but the smaller tribes, they, they don't like it. And later on, in the time of judges, we will see there is a lot of struggle between the tribes. Why? Because, you know, you have two big tribes, the three, because Judah is there, so three big tribes, and everybody else is small, and it's not important, and they don't know what to do with that, and they're jealous, and they fight with each other, and they argue with each other all the time, and they, it's hard for them to keep the unit. <laughs> So the, the author of this book of Joshua is telling them it was given to you by God. And it was given to you by God in a very special way. We can look at that. Verse chapter 18. Then the whole congregation of the sons of Israel assembled in Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land, again, tent of meeting, Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant is the tent of meeting. There remain among the sons of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So Joshua said to the sons of Israel, How long you will be slack to go in and take possession of the land which the Lord the God of your father has given you? And then provide three men from each tribe and will send them to scout out what they might be and down the land, writing description for it, view of the inheritance and then come to me. They shall divide it into seven portions Judah continuing in his territory on the south and house of Joseph in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me. And I will cast lots for you before the Lord our God. God will be directly allotting the land. That's why they cast the lots. So it won't be Joshua who will tell them they cast the lots and out of the seven portions, seven different parts of land, each tribe will draw a lot draw a lot and they will, that will be a, a, a portion to them. Why? Because the author says, don't complain that you own poor piece of land. God has given it to you. Make the best out of it. Don't complain. Don't fight with, with others. That's why they cast lots. And you know, that, that's, that's part of, throughout the whole, like later on book of Judges, book of uh, Samuel and Kings and so on, we'll see that idea of casting lots many times. Because how are we going to, let's say, uh, decide what the will of God is? Sometimes it's 50-50. So what you need to do? Well, you pray and you ask God to choose, right? You cast a lot. I'm not sure how it works, but uh, the explanation is at least you take away the edge because it was a blind faith, right? Every time I've tried that in the casino, it doesn't work. Well, God just wants to keep his money for himself. <coughs> or maybe God assigns you the, the lesser part. <laughs> but, 
But that's the whole idea about casting lots in the Bible, is, is to try to figure out the will of God and letting God to decide. So it's not us who will fight about it or decide. We cast the lots. Whatever comes in, that's God's decision. Yes? In a serious note, what does the Catholic Church believe in that kind of function, like casting lots? Or we try to control it as much as we can. <laughs> <laughs> Look how we elect Pope and others. It's casting lots, but uh, they, don't, they don't do it blindly like that. You know, they vote. So it's the whole idea, you know, we, we don't do that anymore. It's more about prayer. But again, sometimes we just have to flip the coin. That's all you can do sometimes. Because you're going to regret any decision that you make, if you have a choice. Sometimes it's better just to flip the, the coin. Say, okay, this was, but pray before that. Because, okay, that was God's decision. Not mine. So that's why you don't you don't have regrets. Okay, God helped me to decide it, and I'm going to follow it. That's not an official teaching, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but what can you do in certain certain? There are certain times that that's what you need to do. Basically, you have two decisions that we are equally bad to make or equally you know, important, and you can you can do you can only make one decision. You can only go one way. So I would say. Flip the coin and pray. Flip the coin and ask God to guide you through that. So the Levites have no portion. Reminds the Levites have no portion among you. Verse seven: For the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. And Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan eastward, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave them. So we have two and a half tribes already taken care of. Three main, three major tribes. Now is the seven others that that are. Happy. And then we have a listing of those tribes. And start with Benjamin. Why Benjamin? Remember, Joseph, Benjamin. They are the children of the beloved wife. Okay? And then it will be children of the uh, concubine, <coughs> of the slave of that beloved wife. And then it will be children of Leah. And then children of the concubine. That was given by Leah. So there's still this division. It's very biased in favor of Jacob's uh, preferences in marriage. So we see verse 11. The lot of the tribes of Benjamin. And we're going all the time. And you see twice repeated. Verse 20. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Benjamin according to its families. And then verse 28. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Benjamin according to its families. And then Simeon. And Simeon ends up the same way in verse 9 of chapter 19. So this is obtained an inheritance in the midst of the inheritance. And then tribe of Zebulun, verse 16. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Zebulun. Verse 23, Ishahar. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Ishahar. Verse 31. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Asher. And then we have Nephtali, 39. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Nephtali according to its families. And then Dan, which is the very last one. This is the inheritance of the tribe of Dan according to their families. This city with their village. And then verse... So this is, again, it is described as an inheritance. Why an inheritance? Because again, God is allotting the land and it's gift from God. So it's inheritance. They, God's land was promised to their forefathers to Abraham and Jacob and others so they have received that inheritance of that promise that's why the word inheritance is used over and over again but for people of later times it's also a reminder that it's still their land they might not be there but it's still theirs and if you see in, this, in, the, city, in the kingdom of Israel <coughs> all the way till after exile you, know, you never owned let's say your family owned the land always that's why we have this jubilee year that if you have to sell your land because of some difficulties and so on, every 50 years they have to get, give you the, the land back to the original family. Why? Because you don't own the land. God owns the land, you just receive an inheritance. It's part of your inheritance. That's why we have this famous story with King Ahab and vineyard, uh, that he wants the vineyard of his neighbor and he doesn't want to sell him to... Uh, bad Queen Jezebel, he arranges to have the guy killed, 
and king, st- king takes over the vineyard and the prophet comes in uh, to king and tells him because of that your blood will be spilled the same way the blood of the I think, uh, Nahim or Nahum I think his name was so why because the land belongs to God king has no right to take the land away it belongs to God and it belongs to that family this inheritance of the family so that's how important that inheritance part is and there they kind of affirm that division by verse 49 when they had finished distributing the several territories in the land of inheritance as inheritance the, se- the sons of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua the son of Nun so Joshua receives extra po- special portion apart from everything else why? well because he is the chief chief the chief uh, of, the, of, the, of the army and he is also the one who is doing the distribution by command of the Lord they gave him the city which he asked Timnarat Seh in the hill country of Ephraim and he will build the city it's end of chapter 19 verse 49 of chapter 19 and he will build the city and settled it in this is the ceiling of the division and this one verse 51 these are the inheritances which Eleazar the priest of Joshua and son of Nun and the heads of the father's house of the tribes of the son of Israel distributed by lot at Shiloh before the Lord and the door of the tent meeting was closed so they finished dividing the land and then land is divided now there is a little order to do which means city of refuge and the Levite city the Levites so let's read that the purpose of the city of refuge chapter 20 then the Lord said to Joshua so it's again it's God command God command that this city of refuge has to be established say to the son of Israel appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses that the manslayer who kills any person without intent or unwittingly may flee there they shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood he shall flee to one of the cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders of that city that they shall take him into the city and give him a place and he shall remain with them and if the avenger of blood pursues him they shall not give up the slayer into his hands because he killed his neighbor unwittingly having no enmity against him in the past and he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment until the death of him who is the high priest at the time then the slayer may go again into his own town and his own home to the town from which he fled so again either when he dies or when high priest dies that's the two moments that he will be released from the city okay. so we see this whole idea about uh, protecting people from vengeance unnecessary vengeance so it wasn't that you know, I kill someone by accident it's still, there's still justice justice has to be rendered that's why the person has to leave the family the land everything and has to live in that city of refuge that punishment it's like jail time today you know you, you're in jail for, for life or for 25 years for killing someone you know in an accident and things like that but there is no killing because this is God is trying to civilize the, the Israelites because what was, us, what was the usual punishment if you remember the book of Deuteronomy a tooth for a tooth an eye for an eye okay? which means you killed someone you're going to get killed what was before Deuteronomy if you kill someone when you look at the book of Genesis the son of Cain who said if, Cain, if someone harms Cain you know, he would be harmed seven times but if someone harms me I'm going to kill the entire family and, and so on the whole idea was, was like uh, Sicilian Vendetta when you, you know, read or watch movies about Sicilians you kill someone from the family they're going to go and kill everybody in your family right? Be- why? because that's the punishment to prevent any further elements like that God is civilizing the Israelites he's telling them the punishment should correspond to the crime but also if it's, it's a crime that is committed unwillingly it's because accident there will be justice but that person cannot be killed they have right to live because they did not do they did not kill someone with premeditation because when you kill someone with, you know on premeditation you're going to get killed yes wouldn't that lend itself to someone saying no you know like it was a mistake it was by accident if they really had it for well, they, they really yeah. wanted to kill someone yeah well, they, they have to make their case 
and then also they will look at the circumstances. If you remember the book of Deuteronomy, it was very clear how the, how the act was committed, uh, let's say, what, was, what were the circumstances and things like that. Everything has to be weighted in. So it was, you know, they get pretty fair trial, actually. Because, you know, they give example. If you build a house and the, the beam that you hold up falls down and falls on someone, you didn't mean to kill that person, but you're still going to be killed by the family if you don't run. Because they have right to take a life for life. So that would be one of these examples of that. But if you were waiting for someone to kill him, or you robbed someone in the house, you went to someone's house and killed him, you know, this, that's not an accident. You meant to kill those people. Right? Yes? I'm curious about the refuge cities. Do people remarry even though they left families behind? Um, also, was there an, like an element, because maybe the people that went there didn't have good like self-control or impulse control? Were they kind of more rowdy, these cities? Um, I'm not sure because... So okay. No, no. The cities of refuge are run by the Levites, which are Levites, in which is the priestly class in Israel. So they, yeah, oh no, they will be strict pretty much. When it comes to impulse control, again, that person has to make their case before they enter the city. Okay? So if you have problems, they, those, those people have some experience with that. If not, if then later on you don't be, you misbehave in the city, they probably will kick you out. Because again, those cities are run by Levites. Priests, uh, the, you know, priests, we are pretty much uh, <laughs> <laughs> fixed on things. Uh, let's say, yeah, you know, order is part of what we do, right? So they whip them into shape, yeah, either that or they will kick them out. Yeah. As uh, simple as it is. So, uh, about marriage and so on, well, again, those people, that's the punishment. That person runs by, by itself. If, if the wife want to join, but the problem is what they will live on. No, they have nothing. You know, if you use own the land and things like that, then you in the city of refuge, you have nothing. How are we going to support your family? Your family stays where they are on your land. Someone else will take care of them. You in for whatever time you you in. Okay, because again, there was very few people who has, who has a specialized craft. There's very few people like that at that time. So mostly was everything was uh, shepherds and uh, farmers. That's what they were most of them. And you cannot take anything with you. Well, they might give you some, you know, few, few coins if they have, or some silver, but other than that, what you have on you, that's yours, and that's it. You said. That's sleep? part of the punishment as well. Where do they sleep? Well, usually when they sleep, you know, at that time they have their, their like a uh, robe that they sleep, wrap themselves around with. Yeah, those are tough times. You know, they didn't survive. Long. I told you the life expectancy at that time was for men probably like 35 for women maybe 50 if they didn't li- die in childbirth first men will be always you know, worse and any and disease an infection will kill you any infection tooth infection will kill you there's no anti- antibiotics you know so it was a very tough life there were also tough people well, it says that after the high priest dies he would return to his village and to his home. Yeah, that was like an, an amnesty Does time. Does that mean though that the home was left unoccupied all that time? Is well, no, they would have family because they have a wife or parents and things like that. So he would be able to move back in with them. Yeah. And would the family of the deceased person that killed was killed or died in the accident would they be able to go after him at that time, or he has no? He paid. He paid his price. He pays the price. Yeah. No, they were they were pretty strict on that. So what if they ran away from this uh, refuge? What if uh, they decided they didn't want to be there and they ran away? They well, them? then they exposed themselves to danger of being killed by the uh, by the avenger of the family, by the family of the person that they killed, because. Where are they going to hide? You know, wherever they go, they go usually back to the family. And family next door, whoever, that the news spreads. You know, this is a small society. Everything is small. Like South Miami. Something happens in South Miami, everybody knows. Right? This is even smaller. So everybody knows. So they will be after you. You're not going to go somewhere else because everywhere you go, you have no connections. 
You have no family. You have nobody to support you. Nobody to protect you. And the, the only people that will protect you will be your family at that time. Maybe your tribe. If they were, you know, pretty tight. But other than that, you're on your own. Okay? So we hear the description of the cities of refuge. And there were six cities of refuge. Three of them were on the west bank today, not the west bank, of the, where the Jordan is, on the west side of Jordan, and three of them were in Israel proper. So that people who lived beyond the Jordan, they had the same opportunity to run to those three cities, to those cities of refuge, as the one who lived, who lived in Israel proper. So this was more or less the same idea. So we had six cities, uh, and then each tribe, we see the list of each tribe that contributed to the cities of Levites. So we have 48, uh, verse 41 in chapter 21. The cities of the Levites in the midst of possession of the sons of Israel were in all 48 cities with their pasture lands. These cities had each its pasture lands around it, so it was with all the cities. And the very end of it, Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he swore to give to their fathers. And having taken possession of it, they settled there. And the Lord gave them the rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel has failed. All came to pass. Happy end. Everything is good. They settled in land, and as long as Joshua lives, and the elders that they with with him, nothing wrong will happen. Because Joshua and the elders will, will keep the Israelites in line, and they will be faithful to the covenant. Problem is, Joshua dies, and then the rest of his you know, people die, of, the, of his uh, elders. What's happening there? Book of Judges. Which is constant fight, constant fall. Sin, punishment, cry for help, delivering, again, peace, sin, punishment, delivering, so 12 times, over and over again. Why? Because if people don't have a leader that will guide them, especially Jewish people, they will be fighting with each other and they will never be faithful. So they always need someone who is clear leader in faith. Well, Catholics have the same thing. You know, we always need a clear leader who is in line with, with teaching of the church. When things happen that is not uh, not like that, then we have problems. So you see, that, that's how it always. Nothing new under the sun. It's all the same thing. Are we done? So let's stop here for ten minutes. So as you've seen, chapter twenty-one ended up on the happy ending when everything ended up well, and here we go. Chapter 22, we have the first conflict. It didn't last too long, this peace. So what's happening in chapter 22? Never does. <laughs> the two and a half tribes go beyond the Jordan. And the first thing they do, they erect, erect an altar. They make an altar on which they sacrifice. So the rest of the tribes, they get a little scared. Why? Because they still reminded, remember what happened when the guy that was in Jericho stole from God. So all of a sudden, okay, they, they sacrificed to God knows whom. God was going to punish us all. So what they do? They proclaim the war on those two and a half tribes. Okay, let's, read, let's go to the chapter. It's a good reading. Well, remember there was there were still there were still pagans living in that in that area, so they went back and those uh, say tribes that remain in the proper Israel, they said, oh, they probably uh, sacrificed to some other god, not to our god. So they said, now we're going to set up. We need to punish them. Why? Because if we don't punish them, God will punish us. <laughs> Prevention, or you know, smart move on the part. So we start with verse 10 of chapter 22. And when they came to the region about the Jordan that lies in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of great size. So it wasn't just any altar, it was huge. 
And the son of Israel has heard that, said, Behold, the Reubenites and Gadites and half tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region about the Jordan, at the site that belongs to the sons of Israel. And when the sons of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the sons of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. But, verse 13, they sent to the Reubenites, Gadites, Manasseh, some people with them, the ten chief, one from each of the tribal families of Israel. Every one of them had a family among the clans of Israel. So what they do, they send in the elders, people who have, who are ruling the clans, the tribes. And they came to the Reubenites and they said to them, Thus says, verse 16, the whole congregation. So everybody is, is in there. It's not just one tribe or whatever, everybody is upset. What is this treachery which you have committed against God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourself an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? Have we had not enough of the sin of Peor from which even yet we have not yet cleansed ourselves and from which, from which came the plague, plague upon the congregation of the Lord? That you must turn away from this day from following the Lord and if you rebel against the Lord today, he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel tomorrow. But now, if your land is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land when the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take for yourself a possession among us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, or make us rebels by building yourself an altar other, other than the altar of the Lord our God. So did not Aham, the son of Zerah, break, break faith in the matter of the devoted things, and the wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel. And he did not perish alone for his iniquity. So first we have a concern for national unity. They said, if you cannot live here and follow God, you go back with us and we will give you land and you will be fine. But you have to be following the same God. We have to follow our God because if we don't, if you don't, then we will get punished. And okay, this is a lesson <clears throat> for the time of divided kingdom. What's happened in divided kingdom? The ten tribes from the north split from two tribes in the south. Two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah. The rest of them, after Solomon's death, you know, the sons of Solomon want to impose extra taxes. They said, forget it, we have it. We're not, we're not going to be with you. What you do? Remember, the temple is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in between Benjamin and Judah, in the south. What do the northerners have to do, especially since they elected their own king? What would that king do? Well, he's not going to send his people to go to Judah because they might hear things and they might rebel against him and then join Judah again. So what he does, he builds he build a shrine in Bethel and he, in that shrine, he said, we worship Yahweh, our God, but it's a, a separate shrine. So this is basically the situation that is mirrored here. Okay? So the author of this book is kind of telling them this is not the way of doing it. You cannot build yourself an altar. Because you have, we have only one God, okay, book of Deuteronomy. One nation, one God, one place of worship. That's it. That's, it. That's Israel. That's what we have. So, let's see what the solution is, what they, how they explain themselves. Then the Reubenites, Gadites, and Manasseh said in answer to the heads of families of Israel, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God the Lord, again they repeat verse 22, the mighty, Lord, the mighty God, the Lord, He is the Lord, He is the Lord, He knows, and let Israel itself know, it was not rebellion or breach of faith towards the Lord, spare us not today, for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord, for if we did so, to offer burnt offering or cereal offering or peace offerings on it, may the Lord Himself take vengeance. No, but we did it from fear that in time to come, you children may say to our children, What have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you. You Reubenites and Gedites, you have no portion in the Lord. So your children may make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore we said, Let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, not for sacrifice, but to bear a witness between us and you, and between the generations after us, that we perform the service of the Lord in His presence, and so on and so forth. So what is happening there? This is very, very anti, <coughs> let's say, northern politics. Someone who wrote this is certainly from the south. So what he, what he writes, he, he writes in this book that unlike those Reubenites, Malachites, and Gadites, 
who build an alt- altar as a, uh, let's say, a reminder of national unity. Because what was this, the altar? They, they will say later on, it's a witness. They name the altar witness. Why? Because it will remind people from the main Israel, from beyond the Jordan, <coughs> that they are the same people. They don't worship on that altar. They will be, wor- will be worshiping before the Ark of the Covenant. But they build it so that the, the other people cannot say, you don't belong to us. You are different people. Because that's what happened exactly between north and south. What would the northerners say? I said, Jerusalem is not the real place. We have the real place. And we worship God in there. We're not, we're not going to Jerusalem because that's not the real place. So this is in a way, this is, uh, the author is telling basically people from the north, this is what you're supposed to do. You might build an altar in Bethel. But that will be just something like a witness. You still need to come to Jerusalem to worship. Because if you don't, then you forget and you renounce the covenant, you will be punished. And that's what's going to happen. Because the north will fall very quickly to the Assyrians in period of a couple of hundred years. Okay? So this is the whole idea about struggle. And that's why the, the, the altar is a witness that they don't worship there. They just want a unity. They want to be part of it. Like Israelites, they will be from the south. You know, that's, let's say, this is the unity. You, to, you cannot worship over there. You have to come to us and worship with us. And then, and they repeat that witness a couple of times, verse 28, and then verse 30. When Phineas, the priest, and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the Reubenites, Gadites, Menasites spoke, it pleased them well. And the Phineas, the son of Eleazar, priest, said to the Reubenites and Gadites, Menasites, Today we know that the Lord is in the midst of us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now we have saved the sons of Israel from the hand of the Lord. And then we turn back and they tell to the people of Israel, they reported there. And then verse 34, the Reubenites and Gadites called the altar witness, for they said, it's a witness between us that the Lord is God. So they worship the same God. That's the God of unity. So it's again, one God, one nation, one place of worship. The altar is just erected to, to remind them where they're supposed to go to worship. So they're very committed to national unity. Remember, for people who are divided, like between south and north during a civil war, uh, the unity, talk about unity is very important. That's why I think Abraham Lincoln was good on that. He always was calling for unity. And he would use the book of Joshua, actually. When you read some of his speeches, you, you might see how, how, how much he used this call for unity, national unity. So, verse 30, 23 to chapter 23, 24, the two closing chapters. They are chapters that renew the, is again about renewal of the covenant. And reminder about unity. Because when you look at beginning of chapter 24, so we have, a long time afterwards, when the Lord has given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, the elders, the heads and the judges and officers. So, he calls everybody. It's interesting, he does not call the Levites, if you look at that. He calls everybody else but the Levites. Why? Because the Levites are not depending. Their their possessions of cities does not depend on land. So, they are not concerned with land because they are concerned with covenant and they are teachers of the covenant. So, he's telling them, I am old and well advanced in years, and you have seen that the, all that the Lord our God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who fought for you. So they weren't just fighting themselves, God was fighting for them. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes these nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight and you shall possess their land as the Lord you God promised you. Therefore be very steadfast to keep, do, to keep and do all that is written in the book of law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not be mixed with these nations left here among you, or to make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down yourself to them, but cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. Again, the reminder for the Lord has driven you. So basically in this chapter, the author is listing, listing the, uh, all the sins that the Israelites have committed later on in the time of judges, kings. 
and divided kingdom. It was always the same thing. They forgot that God has given them the land. So what they did, they intermarried with the pagans that were still living there. They start following their gods. They start worshipping their gods. And that's why God will punish them for that. So this is the sin of the least. And when you look later on, especially at the book of Judges and the prophets, it's always the same story. You know, prophets will always tell the Israelites, you turn, you forget the covenant, you marry the pagans, you worship the gods, you, you know, pollute the land with, this, with the sacrifices, God will punish you, God will bring the punishment. Why? Because you turn away from the covenant. So it has to be a sense of the punishment. You turn away from God, God will turn away from you. And you're going to be punished for this. So the God has driven them. And then verse 11. It's a call to book of Deuteronomy. Take good heed to yourselves, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Again, the covenant, the covenant to, commandment to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and join the remnants of these nations left here among you, and make marriages with them, and again he repeats the whole list. What does it mean to, to love the Lord your God? I always repeat, in the Bible, love is not a feeling. Love is a choice that you make for others. So they always have to make choice for God. Not for anything else, but for God. So love the Lord your God with all your heart. And your neighbor, as you said, book of Deuteronomy. That's what it is. Which meaning, our heart, which is the, the place which we, we think and make will in uh, the Bible, so we always have to will and make choice for God. And that's our dedication to God. We may mess up because you know, we're not perfect, but the whole idea is make choice for God all the time. Okay. Verse 14 of chapter 23. And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So Joshua is basically saying, I'm dying, so you better listen to what I'm telling you. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them failed. So he repeated it three times, remember. Nothing fails, all has to, have to, fulfill, to fulfillment, nothing has failed. Three times is a superlative. God has per- fulfilled everything in a perfect way. But just, verse 15, as all the good things which the Lord you God promised concerning you has been fulfilled to you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from of this, go- of this good land which the Lord you God has given to you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord you God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and you shall perish quickly from of the good land which he has given to you. So the first meeting is over. He kind of gives them points. If you keep the covenant, if you are for God, everything will be good. But God will punish. God will curse the land because of you. What is happening here? At the end of the first meeting, there is no response from the people. So either they are scared, or they just kind of try to have to think about that. Because when we go to the second meeting right now, there will be a response. So sometimes we have to I repeat to people things twice. So the first time doesn't sink in, maybe second time. So again, we're going to hear over again this covenant warnings. The judgment will come with violation of the covenant. So verse 20, chapter 24 again, the Joshua gathered again all the tribes of Israel to Shechem this time. And then some of the elders, the heads, the judges, the officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your father lived of old behind Euphrates, and he reminds them, recalls the whole history of salvation. First of Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, then Esau, then Moses, then Aaron, when you look at that, the fathers in Egypt, and then Moses again, then Balak and Sipor, Balaam and Jordan, and they, how they kill, and send the hornets, verse 12, send the hornets before you, which drove them out. So he reminds them everything that God has done for them from Abraham leaving the city. Why? Well, because they need to renew the covenant right now. Because they're in the land and he wants them to make a commitment again and again. So verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. 
Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if you be unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day from whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of Amorites and those who in whose land you dwell. So basically, he's giving them this uh, opportunity to make decision again. As we did, Moses did in book of Deuteronomy, as Joshua did at the beginning of, of this book, he, he tells, make the choice now. You make choice to live or to die. If you listen to the uh, readings this morning, that's, that's for the second day, you know, Thursday after us, Wednesday. You know, I'm setting a choice before you. Choose life or choose death. Okay. And then this most famous words of Joshua in chapter 15. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see all the house's blessings and all the other things. So this is from this time. When Joshua is telling them, you have to make choice, but me and my family, we make choice for the Lord. Okay? Great line. Then the people answered. You see, here we have the response. Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is Lord our God who brought us our father up from land of Egypt out of the house of, house of bondage and who did gr- those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples to whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples. And then jo- verse 19, Joshua is warning them again. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive you transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. It's a verbatim from the book of Exodus. When Moses is bringing commandments, second time, and standing before people, and they said, No, we, serve, we will serve the Lord. Now later on in the book of Deuteronomy, renewal of covenant, the same thing. We will serve the Lord. Here is another time. We will serve the Lord. How long is it going to last? Till the death of Joshua. And they, they do their own thing. So that's why Joshua knows what he's doing. That's why he's warning them three times. He's warning them. Then Joshua said to people, <coughs> verse 22, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the, chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. And then he reminds them again. Then put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances at them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote this book in the book of the law of God. And he took a a great stone, not only any stone, great stone, and set it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. Remember, that stone becomes a witness of their covenant. <clears throat> so every time they go to Bethel, they go to sorry, Shechem, they will see this great boulder. And they know this is a reminder of the covenant that they made with God. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. But for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. Therefore it shall be a witness against you lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. So this is the great thing. Joshua says the covenant again. He sets up a visible reminder of the covenant. And he tells them, this stone is a witness, and you are witnesses yourself. Remember, in Jewish uh, proceeding, you need two witnesses before the court. So, the stone is the witness and the people themselves are witness of their fidelity or infidelity. They are witness to the covenant, that they made that covenant with God. Right? It always takes two witnesses. So verse 29, After these things Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. So as you see, it took, it took them a while to conquer that land. It wasn't overnight. And they buried him in his own inheritance, at Tim Sareh, which is you know, the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaz. Again, Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. He was one of the uh, descendants of Joseph, from the sea son Ephraim. That's why he's being buried in the land of Ephraim. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, and had known all the works which the Lord did for Israel. 
So they leave it there, because once you start Book of Judges, you will see what's happening. And the bones of Joseph, they were buried in Shechem, and the Eliezer died and was buried, and so on. What is important here, Joshua dies, and there is not a leader that he appoints to follow him. We have some elders, who are elders of the Israel, of the tribes, but there is not one leader. Okay? Why? Because that will be problem with the book of Judges. Because there was no leader, there was no king, everybody did whatever they wanted. Whatever they were, they thought was right. You will see that phrase, everybody did what they thought was right, in the book of Judges, I don't know how many times, I didn't count it yet, I need to count it, so that you can count it for me, you know, if you, if you do that. But the whole idea is, Joshua, it's this period between entering of the promised land and death of Moses till the time of Judges. And it was time of conquering and dividing the land, time of unity. Why? Because there was one leader. Moses was the leader, Joshua was the leader, the whole Israel stayed together. Once there was not one leader, what's happening? They start falling apart. And we have period of how many judges? Twelve. Guess. It has to be twelve. <laughs> Could be seven, but actually, actually it's <coughs> two sets of six, but still two is twelve of them. Because why? Because there's twelve tribes and twelve judges. And that will be time that will be very, very, it's a lot of turmoil, a lot of fight, a lot of uh, wars going on. And that leads us to book of, uh, well, Ruth is uh, kind of like uh, inter- intersection of the part, part of that. It was book of Samuel. Because at the beginning of book Samu- of Samuel, Samuel will be the last judge of Israel. And he will be the one who will be a transition between judges and kings. Because he will be the first one who anoints the first and the second king of Israel. So this whole idea, you know, people cannot... Okay, remember, there is only one king in Israel. God. God is the king of Israel. There is no other. Unfortunately, uh, people, everybody who listens to God, hears a different message. And they all want to do their own thing. So they, people need a visible, let's say, representative of God for the nation. That's who king, who king is. King is not divine. He is not something, anything special. He is just a representative of God, before, of, of God for the nation and the nation to God. So he's kind of intermediary. But he is also the one who will be uh, administrate an administrator and also a warrior, a, a leader because people need a leader if we, have a we- if we have weak leaders you see what's happening right now <laughs> there is no brain for leader and there is no brain for the country that's what's happened so this, you see, that there is a, that's what Bible, it's your Bible it's like, you know, if we don't learn from the history well, we're going to repeat that mistake over and over again but Joshua, he does not appoint any leaders. Why? Because he still believes that God will lead the people. Yes, Father? Okay, no, you answered. I was just going to say, yeah. why did he yeah. appoint someone yeah. before he died? Because so he, ju- because he just, was remember, he just renewed the covenant. Right. And everybody says, we will follow. Um, so he said, okay, <laughs> they will listen to God. Last f- lasted five minutes after his death. <laughs> but that's unfortunate for our, our human nature. And so that's why later on Samuel he does not want to appoint a king. He said, no, God is the king of Israel, I'm not going to appoint one. But God is telling him, do. Because we, they need a human in charge. Someone who will be my representative. So it's, it's a very uh, you know, later on in like Middle Ages and later on they push it to the other end that they said that every king was uh, God's anointed one. Right? So you could not touch the king. Or even like you saw the crowning of Charles, King Charles the Fourth, whatever his name was. He was like God's appointed king, son of David, whatever titles they use. You know, like a whole whole list of them. But this whole idea is okay. This is a visible representative of God to people, and this is a leader that people need, someone who who can enforce certain things, but someone also who can teach and lead. Because if the leader does not teach and does not lead, guess what? Well, we see what's going on. It has to be someone who can lead and someone who also who teaches and ho- helps people responsible for their behavior. And we didn't have leaders like that for ages. You know. I think what well, John Paul II was the last one. <laughs> In a public role, I think who was maybe that? Uh, yeah, Ronald Reagan. Reagan was pretty good on that. Sticking to people and holding them responsible. 
and teaching them as well. After that, yeah, in the world, you know, it's like, so it's, it's very hard. And people are afraid to be leaders. You know, the people, we, said, we saw that in the pandemics. People are afraid to, lead, to be leaders. Why? Because you make a decision, you're going to be held responsible for it. How easy it is to make a wrong decision? Very easy. So what? Because you're afraid of making the, of making decision, meaning you have to just let people go and, you know, just shut the whole the world and so on. Because you have no ball, let's say, no guts to make any decision. Either way. So that's why right. it's hard to have, to, to be a good leader and to have good leaders, to follow good leaders. So we have to pray for them. Even if, if you don't like them, pray for them. <laughs> Whatever it is, pray for them. But God will find a solution. And God will find a solution. Okay, any questions concerning Joshua? Just remember, this is this. In the modern day Israel, is there anyone who can trace their lineage back to what tribe they belong to and where they lived? Or has there been so much back and forth migration that okay. The ones that can trace their lineage for sure are the Levites and the Kohanites. They do because they did genetical research a few years back and even the genetics con- confirmed their own lineage because the Kohanites, the, which means they are the highest priests, the Ko- Kohanim, they come from one, one guy. The whole genetics come from one guy. They have a different gene than the rest of the Levites. But the, but the, you know, the, the genome that they made they can trace it and they do have this tradition. Yeah. The, those ones for sure. The, the other ones, I don't think so. Because they did some, they, they are too much, too, too mixed there. But the Levites, yes. The only ones that think still. And they know their lineage. They know who they, where they're coming from. Yeah. Well, when you look at Book of Leviticus and Numbers and things, they have it all figured out. Yeah. So, any questions about Joshua? So for next week, read the first six chapters of Judges. It's fun reading. It's a lot of action. <laughs> and a lot of weird things going on as well. So. <laughs> but we'll look to that because it's important to look at this transition that is happening there. Yeah. And you will see the difference because first two chapters will be basically retelling the story of Joshua. And then they will, they will start with their own stories. And some judges have only like one line about them. Some of them have chapters. Some of them have a couple of lines. Some of them have more than that. But it's, we're talking about six major judges and six minor judges. And we'll, we'll look to that later. I'm going to give you background of the book next week. And I think that's basically it for today. If you don't have any questions, we good. So you just finished the book of Joshua. If you never read it before, hey, congratulations. You made it. You made it. <laughs>